Jackson, you look like you're ready of sorts. Uh, you're muted. Uh, just make sure. I'm unmuted now. I'm. You're unmuted. I can hear you. So I'll uh, I'll sort of start our introduction here. We'll let the last few people get settled. But uh, good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Stevens. I'm the garden director for the Botanic Garden, the Conservatory, and the Japanese Tea Garden. I'm very happy to welcome you uh, to our event this evening. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to encourage all of you to use the Q&A feature during the talk. Uh, we're one year into Zoom sessions, um, but just like to remind everyone, there's a Q&A function in the bottom part, of the middle screen with two bubbles. You know, we'll be using that to uh, help organize questions for Saxon uh, this evening. And you know, we'll reserve time at the end for as many questions as we have time. Uh, but now I am truly excited and honored to welcome our guest Saxon Holtz uh, with us this evening. Uh, Saxon is an award-winning garden photographer of more than 20 books is on the board of the Pacific Horticulture Society, is a fellow of GardenCom, the Garden Writers Association, and is an advisory council member at the Conservatory of Flowers. Uh, Saxon has a long standing relationship with the San Francisco Botanic Garden, both as a garden photographer and as a photography instructor. His stunning photographs, I'm sure you have all seen, uh, they're on our website, on many of our publications, if you see something from the garden, you have likely seen the work of Saxon. So tonight, Saxon will take us on a, photo, a photographic journey through his uh, new book, Gardening in Summer Dry Climates, Plants for a Lush Water Conscious Landscape, co-authored with Nora Harlow, Gardening in Summer Dry Climates, is a guide to native and climate adapted plants for summer dry, winter wet climates of North America's Pacific Coast. And on a personal note, uh, I am really close friends uh, with Saxon. Just the couple of weeks ago, me and my, you know, uh, he always invites us over. He always invites me over for yard work. Um, and you know, me and my son were actually out in his uh, yard helping him weed oxalis out of his uh, stunning garden. But he, uh, we're cheap uh, labor for him, and he puts us to work whenever. Uh, we have a moment and uh, you know we're really we're neighbors and have uh, got, become friends uh, over the years and again really am very excited to uh, welcome Saxon this evening. So Saxon, uh, the mic is yours. Well thank you Matthew, that's a very gracious introduction um, and to the audience anyone who wants to come to my house to weed I will feed them hot dogs as well and so that is part of the deal. Um, I um, but it really is nice to have Matthew nearby um, as someone who enjoys gardens uh, as much as I do. I'm gonna share my screen so I can be talking um, to you from my background screen um, and make sure that's working. I think we can see what I call my, my patio. Um, this is a shot from the book, but it's also a uh, opportunity when we have questions to go to the patio and we'll have questions um, throughout in several breaks in the presentation so that um, I really want to hear about what you guys have to say. Um, Matthew mentioned my long association with Botanic Garden. Um, uh, when I first came to California and I was a commercial photographer, but decided to become a garden photographer because I love gardening so much. And I just uh, lived at Six and Balboa in the Golden, next to Golden Gate Park and the Botanic Garden became my oasis, my teaching point, my uh, sanctuary. And I learned so much from the Botanic Garden and continue to learn from the Botanic Garden. It is truly an asset uh, on so many levels to so many communities. And I'm just grateful to be a part of it. And, and thank you, you know, for including me in the, in the programming. Um, and I, I think it's important really to get to that. It's uh, increasingly in my own career, I've, I find it's really important that we understand uh, the relationship of gardens to climate. Um, the climate really is changing rapidly. I think we all know that. Uh, but get, botanic gardens and, and our own small gardens can really make a difference. Um, some of you may know the work of Doug Tallamy, um, wonderful author and entomologist, who says in his new book about gardening, it's called Nature's Best Hope, that it's tempting to garden for beauty, 
without regarding the many ecological roles our landscapes must perform. I think we need to resist any definition of beauty that entirely does not include ecological roles. When we garden for beauty, we must garden for the beauty of nature. Um, and that's really why I'm here for the beauty of nature and the climate. I hope we can all make, understand we can make a difference. And the book is part of the Summer Drive project um, with the new book. Um, and it gives me really a chance to talk about all this. Uh, a lot of you probably know the original book I worked on um, with Nora Harlow, the book for East Bay Mud, um, which is now out of print, um, but was really successful. And I, we were really pleased with the response we got from that. Um, and we wanted to enlarge that book um, and talk about the whole West Coast. Um, I'm going to talk more later about maps, but fundamentally, all the West Coast has dry summers. It's not, not called drought. That's predictably dry. That's our climate. And for all the gardens, we want to understand garden tolerant plants. Um, the project itself is, say the book is the obvious fulfillment of that. Just this year, we've been working on it for four years, but we also work with the um, state of California, the Wuckels database, which you see in the upper right a window from that. Um, and we have an Instagram account and a website with newsletters but the Wuckels, um, for those of you who don't know it, it's a official database for the state of California for all plants that are sold um, so they can have a water classification so that when uh, anyone who's doing a large garden installation of over 2000 square feet that requires a uh, um, ordinance, uh, a conditional ordinance to, to have the installation done, you have to show the plants are water efficient. And the Wuckels database is that database uh, it doesn't have any photos or plant descriptions in it, which means it's, to me it's a total, you know, it's, it's a waste of effort by the state not to have it. So we, our grant in the Summer Dry Project is to add photos and plants to it for the low and very low water use plants to encourage people to use those best plants. Um, but it's, it's fundamentally about really gardening um, where you are, no matter what part of the state, uh, West Coast or the country or the world where you garden, you should understand where you garden. Um, this is where I live um, and where Matthew lives. Uh, we can both walk to this. Uh, this is Mount Bordell State Park. And here we see a flowering buckeye, um, which is one of our iconic trees or native trees. It does so well um, in, the, in, our, in our climate. Um, and I really wanna place this presentation on the in context of, 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 of gardens themselves and, and, the, and the climate change that we, we're in the midst of. Um, it's really all the more important that we gardeners be stewards of the land, attuned to the local environment on behalf of all creatures. Every small act we do adds resiliency. And I, I wanna make that point that that's, every gardener has that chance. Every small act we do can really make a difference. Um, we, we took the, the original book was just targeted to the Bay Area. The new book is the entire West Coast and the various summer dry sub-regions within it um, for the sake of trying to you know, get some order to it, we divide it into four sections. Um, uh, the upper left is Southern California, the upper right, Central California, lower right, Northwest, and the up lower left is right here in Northern California. Um, the uh, lower in um, Southern California, we use the coastal chaparral as our touchstone um, ecotone as an example. This is uh, Torrey Pine State Park, um, right on the ocean um, in, in full bloom with all the native plants looking really good. Um, here we have representing the Central Valley, the hotter regions uh, with, with very little marine influence. Uh, this is Carrizo Plain and, and a really nice uh, super bloom a few years ago for the North, for, I can continue to use my same wonderful Mount Burdell shot to show Oak Woodlands, which is sort of the iconic landscape for much of Northern California. Um, and then for the Northwest, we use this uh, state park near Portland, um, Camasia State Park. Here you see with the Camasias in full bloom and the native Oregon oaks and white and um, Garia oaks that are you know, native and, and live naturally in their summer dry climate. So we took those native uh, iconic examples and try to tell people to garden where you are and understand where you are. So each part of the book has different, um, e each not each part of the book, every plant really is associated and to be more adapted to different parts in the upper left to um, match the South Southern California. We have this house 
on a bluff overlooking the ocean um, here using uh, carex, a, a sedge as a ground cover, uh, both to give the green sense that a lawn might have provided, but also for fire protection. Um, a lot of folks need to have their landscapes hydrated and, and green to help keep fires from spreading. Um, let me go to the next one. This um, uh, representing the Central Valley and the hotter regions. I really like this, love this picture, in fact, because that dry stack stone wall as it, as it meanders out to the mountains beyond. Uh, it's not a native plant garden. That it's within the native plants, the, the oak trees that flank these, uh, the inside and outside of the garden. But there are a lot of Australian plants in this particular garden. Um, representing the Northwest is a garden from Bellevue Botanic Garden, which is just outside Seattle. It's a marvelous garden and they have a really nice, large uh, water efficient water demonstration garden uh, that, that gets very little summer water. Um, but of course, being in Seattle in the Northwest, they get much more winter water than we would get. So they supports a different vegetation entirely. But here we can see plants that were very similar to other summer dry climates. We see native, we see, um, the ornamental grasses, onions, berberis, uh, lavender, there are all sorts of plants that once you know which ones are adapted to your own microclimate, you can really get, um, take, take, take ideas from the book. Um, and representing Northern California, is this picture I really are, I wanted to be the cover of the book. The, uh, the publisher really knows marketing and they really wanted something that had you know, color and, and lushness on it. But what I liked about this, it's an old garden um, and the mature, uh, madrones, the um, Arbutus uh, marina. It's not the native madrone, but it has that same sort of effect in the garden. And then the large formiums and the lawn been replaced by the ornamental grasses. It's really iconic what can be done in Northern California. Um, but I really want to get into some of the, the maps. Um, the sort of try to understand what the summer dry climate really is all about. Um, we'll start with these, these Copen climate classification maps. Um, he was a, a climatologist in the last century, and he, he wanted to devise formulas that would define climatic boundaries in such a way to correspond with vegetation zones or biomes that were being mapped for the first time during his lifetime. And there, there are 31 different classifications um, and five of them that we traditionally consider Mediterranean. Um, you see CSA, CSB, and CSC. C, which simply is for mild or temperate climates, S for dry summers, and third, A for hot summers, B warm summers, and C cool summers. I'm gonna show some more maps detailing how the dry summer mild temperate zones break in the 28 regional uh, summer dry climates, um, expanding what the term Mediterranean climate is traditionally understood to be. But here you can see how the whole planet divided into vegetation zones and see that there are five very similar climate zones to, to our own. We're gonna call this the summer dry ecotope. Um, and gardeners should really think of their own local climates in terms of vegetation zones and understand them as defined as the smallest ecologically distinct landscape feature in a landscape mapping and classification system. And vegetation zones, of course, that means plants. And gardens that share common ecotopes can often share plants that are adapted, climate tolerant and sustainable. These were the criteria for selecting plants in the new book for which at its core is really just an exploration of which plants from this summer dry ecotope and the other five regions are adapted to each other. We certainly need to have discussions about the habitats, about native plants and how plants from other regions might or might not be a re invasive and, how, and what sort of ecosystem services they might offer to our own gardens. But that's the art of gardening. And really it's why gardeners need good resources to find the adapted plants. No surprise. Gardeners love plants, and we just want to make sure you pick ones that are adapted. So let's move from this ecologically distinct landscape, the ecotope, to the summer dry climate, to ecotones. Um, here, I hope you all recognize the meadow at uh, Menzies Garden at the Arboretum. Um, I'm going to drill down into regional micro microclimates and consider our gardens as ecotones and start visualizing how gardeners, we can all help with that goal of resiliency, because I really, I really think we must. It's a, what's an ecotone? Well, it's a border zone where ecological systems meet and mingle, sometimes forming new communities. Well, that, my friends, is a garden. Um, our sensibilities can and must model ecosystems in those small parts of the earth that are under our care. 
Sure, we can have fun with plants from similar ecotopes, but when we mingle in these new communities we're calling gardens, those plants must be climate adapted. There's just too much at stake with the dramatic change in the climate to do otherwise. Gardeners must be stewards of the land. And as stated in our mission statement, attuned to the local environment on behalf of all creatures. Every small act we do adds resiliency. Your own garden is not just your own, it's your interface with the earth. We are all stewards for garden earth. As gardeners, we have the distinct responsibility these days to think globally and act locally. As gardeners, I would argue we not only have that obligation to planet Earth, we have an obligation to society to model a behavior that is socially responsible and because gardening is valuable. And it's a thrill just knowing that every small act we do makes a difference. Gardens matter. As Doug Tallamy says in his new book, Nature's Best Hope, it's the gardens. That's nature's best hope. And we all have some responsibility in that. I really like the term ecotone as it's applied to gardens. It's the natural progression of understanding climate tolerant gardening from the biomes or those Copen vegetation maps to ecotopes, to ecotones and their own little microclimates, which is how we really need to incorporate all the concepts of naturalistic gardening that include biodiversity and watersheds wrapped around green infrastructure, wildlife corridors and urban oases, where ecological systems meet and mingle, sometimes forming new communities. Air gardens are ecotones, and we are part of the whole and part of the planet Earth. We don't really expect our gardens to be climate classifications though. We want them to have our own special plants beyond whatever endemic natives that might be locally adapted. We certainly want them to be climate tolerant, to fit comfortably into the local microclimates and connect wild nature to our built landscapes. There's no getting around that most of us live in metropolitan areas and almost all need supplemental water. So we must plan for green infrastructure that connects gardens to the ecosystems, those ecotones. But before we go on to discuss some more specific plants and garden examples and how we integrate gardens into green infrastructure, I wanna show another series of maps more specifically about the regional differences within the summer dry climate of the Pacific coast in our part of the world, which when considered as a whole is much broader than the typical Mediterranean. I take these series of maps from the Pacific Bulb Society, which has a fantastic uh, website and it's a resource for summer dry climates across the world. And as you can see here, they've defined them much more broadly than, than what is typically considered a Mediterranean. Um, and understanding these regional ecotopes and microclimates help us understand the similarities and the differences within these regional summer dry climates and will inform us we want to choose plants for our own specific gardens. We see an expansion of the typical Mediterranean climate, including most of the Pacific Northwest and so much of the Middle East and the steppes of Western Asia. It really it's subdivided into 28 measurable classifications far broader than what is typically considered Mediterranean. I don't want to get too deep into this, uh, these charts. It's really sort of fun to, when you have time to study the similarities of, of one city to another and why it might be uh, in one category or another. I find it interesting in the uh, second one left and second one down, they've chosen Point Reyes, California for one of the touchstone points. I, I think it's probably because some members of the Pacific Bulb Society must be in Point Reyes. But um, as an example for our own uh, uh, larger cities and examples we can relate to, I chose a couple of cities in Southern California that were really close to each other, Los Angeles and Riverside, um, which as the Bay Area, they're cities that are uh, really close to each other, but really different as far as climate. And, and, and as far as the 28 classifications of summer dry climates, they're not even adjacent to each other. Um, uh, Los Angeles is both wetter and warmer than, than Riverside. It, it's really a different, um, a vast difference. And we really need to understand how it all changes for our own little microclimates. Um, over the 35 years or so, I've been photographing gardens across the West. I began hearing people talk about Mediterranean gardening and Mediterranean plants. But after an initial flush of wisdom and understanding, the more I traveled from Albuquerque and Denver, Seattle, San Diego, the less I understood what people meant when they said they had a Mediterranean garden. Among gardeners, 
I think the term Mediterranean has become fairly well understood as one adapted to the climate that's a wet one in the winter with relatively few cold periods and summers that are predictably hot and dry. Fostering gardens are designed around outdoor living, using plants living happily with the heat and dry weather of a given microclimate. I, I, I've noticed that all these years that many in the public understand the concept of a Mediterranean lifestyle without understanding the climate, the vegetation, and the many highly ornamental plants adapted to it. For many non-gardeners, the Mediterranean lifestyle is simply outdoor living. A hot, dry summer day under a ramada, a charcuterie plate, maybe of Spanish sausages, some French cheeses, Italian bread, Greek olives, and of course that emblematic bottle of California wine. Um, that's the Mediterranean lifestyle. Uh, I think, I hope we all do know how to appreciate it. But as a journalist and, and a gardener, still learning to appreciate the summer dry climate after growing up in Virginia, which the humid mid-Atlantic where lawns are mowed just to beat back nature, I felt it was my job to find and show a new aesthetic. Gardeners are different here. They must be different here. And it became really my job to illustrate them. For many years, even to up to the beginning of this century, most garden publishers treated all of the West Coast as simply a temperate region, seldom addressing the climate, and more often than not, marveling that gardeners could overcome dry summers with water sucking plants popular in England and East Coast. I, I still remember photographing banana plants when I first started photographing gardens. Um, <laughs> but slowly, as outdoor living in California and the Mediterranean lifestyle began to creep into popular culture, Mediterranean style gardens began to appear in the books and magazines, often associated with wineries and olive trees and fields of rosemary. Gardeners really began to realize how much easier it was to work with plants adapted to the climate, and indeed how wonderful they looked as an authentic connection to nature and the outdoors. Now we're really thinking of these gardens as ecotones. It's my job explicitly as a photojournalist to help gardeners see this new aesthetic and create those ecotone gardens. One more thing about the term summer dry garden, I wanna make sure people understand, is distinctly meant to refer to climate gardening and not gardens that get no summer water. I can give an entire lecture about water for gardens and the need we have as a culture to honor water and put it to its highest use. For many, many reasons, we do need to have supplemental water for municipal water in, for our urban ecotones, not the least of which is the hydration required for fire. The battle for water rights is legendary. And it's ongoing, especially in California, and the amount of water gardens deserve is most certainly debatable, but we should not debate they require some water in urban environments for the sake of the plants amidst all that pavement, as well as the lifestyle of the people. Uh, so that's part of the Summer Drive project as a whole, we want to encourage that ecological approach, specifically describing and illustrating climate tolerant plants in garden settings, where we can celebrate and honor the summer dry climate and redefine beauty as we see it. I'm, I, I think increasingly now in the face of the obvious climate change, it's even more important that the media show solutions. And that's, that's really become our mission. We've added the website, and I mentioned earlier working with the California Center for Urban Horticulture for the Wuckels database. And we have the website and the Instagram account, which I'll um, really have fun with, summerdry.gardens. And I'll talk about that a little later, but um, I'm gonna take a break here. Um, I think we'll have a, a more conversations later about the gardens, but um, this first part is really more about the science and the, uh, the climate behind the gardens. Um, I don't know, I see Matthew has stepped back in whether or not any questions might have come in. Yeah, thank you, Saxon. This is great. Uh, as a reminder, um, Saxon is taking us through a sampling of his new book, Gardening in Summer Dry Climates, Plants for a Lush Water Conscious Landscape. You know, that book is available for purchase at the San Francisco Botanical Garden Bookstore, if you're interested. And uh, just as a reminder, again, the Q&A function in the middle of the screen, feel free to uh, ask any questions you have and we'll organize them. You know, quite, uh, one initial question I had for you, Saxon, I was curious, the uh, serpentine wall that was dry stacked, and, uh, where was that a private garden or a public garden? It was one of the first uh, slides 
would be the fifth or sixth slide in your uh, show. Where was that? Yeah, I know it well. Um, it's actually it's a it's a it's at Presquil Winery, which is down in Santa Maria in Southern California. But that's the home the, the, the owners live on site, so oh. that was their personal home. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's why they were able to, they had the, the, um, the large expanse of nature behind it because they have a, a vineyard around their home. And so, yeah. but it really connects. Uh, I just love the way that that wall takes the eye from the garden out to the environment beyond. Yeah. Yeah, great. We have a couple other questions. Um, you know, are all of these interesting maps and charts in the book? No, no. We have a, a couple of small maps in the book. Um, uh, and the book is mostly uh, a plant encyclopedia. Um, the, the first part, the first uh, quarter, 20% is about the climate, the definition of climate and some of the design considerations. But um, no, the, the, um, I got, I'll open the book right next to me. And I, I know these, these Copen maps are not in it. I think we have a map um, that broadly describes the, um, the Pacific coast and the geographic features of it. But these, these specific maps, um, I like to talk about to help describe why the summer dry climate itself is a broader term than Mediterranean. I think many of us in the Bay Area, although San Francisco is, I refer to as a subtropical cloud forest, is not typically Mediterranean, but it's, um, uh, it, it's, we're more used to that in Northern California, what a typical Mediterranean climate is. But if you go to Seattle or you know, Sacramento or San Diego, or Bakersfield, you start getting different definitions for what Mediterranean actually is. Right. Uh, great, thank you. Another question, you know, I struggled for years with my own situation of dry shades. You know, books on shade gardens always seem to assume shade is damp or wet. Uh, can you comment uh, on dry shade and suitable plants? And, um, you know, even a sub question to that, is uh, can you comment about the need for some summer water versus you know zero escaping? Yeah, well, certainly um, I, I will defer um, the the plant question to the second half. The second half is going to be a lot more about plants, and we can talk about dry shade or clay or fog or all these other things. Um, um, and I, I I do think I, I mentioned that um, the watering is important for the health of the plants. We, we don't live in nature, we live in cities. Um, and so there's a lot of pavement, there's far less trees, there's a whole different uh, considerations of how we garden in cities. And we, we really need to water our, most all of our gardens um, just for the beauty of them and keep them from looking too dry and for hydration. Um, and that's a, you know, a, a question that's always in debate when municipalities talk about water allotments and, um, and it's a, a fair debate to have, but certainly some water is required to keep our cities and our gardens healthy. Um, and it's, it's, it's a matter of how much water and how much we pay for it is an ongoing question. But it's, um, this is, uh, when we first came up with a title for this book, we had a number of people who said, oh, you mean you have a, for gardens that have no summer water? Um, and uh, we, we wanted to make sure the word climate is in the, in the title, summer dry climates, and then how you garden within that. It's, as I said in the earlier first part of the presentation, when I first started taking garden pictures, there was very little recognition of drought and, and that, that dry summers were a problem. Um, dry summers were great for many gardeners because there was no, no fungus. There was, you can grow all kinds of things, just add water. I, I mentioned banana plants. I was amazed how many banana plants I would photograph as ornamental plants in gardens, but they really suck a lot of water. Um, sure. And so it didn't, um, so we've really changed our thinking about, about gardening and we continue to need to change that. Um, and it's really why we did the, why I do my work. I, I think it's important as a photographer who's seeing all this stuff to, to make sure other people see it. Um, Cause it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's really wonderful to connect to your own local habitats. Yeah, great. And then two other questions here that I think are quick. There was a name of a garden near Portland you mentioned early oh. on. Can you please advise what the name of? Uh... Yeah, that's a. Uh, it, I think it's actually, it might even be in the city limits of extended Portland. It's called Camasia, like the plant Camasia uh, State Park or Camasia uh, Reserve. I think it might be actually a Nature Conservancy um, site, mm -hmm. but it's it's in 
it's it's within 20 minutes of, of downtown Portland. Um, it's really a wonderful sanctuary. Um, and in a good year, like when I was there, the Camasias are, are carpets. Um, it's really a lovely place. Great. And then just a question that I think I can answer uh, by my good friend or our good friend, Jane Scourge. Uh, you know, this session is being recorded uh, tonight. Uh, this is so important, uh, informative and important information during a critical uh, sort of drought year, dry time. Uh, the session is being recorded and I will do believe will be available on the San Francisco Botanical Garden website after. So I'm going to hand back over to Saxon. He's going to take us deeper into plants. Uh, but please keep the questions coming using that Q&A function and we'll have some time at the end. Saxon, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks. Nick. Um, yeah, I really want to um, talk really a lot more about the various kinds of plants that are adapted to the garden. And I, uh, I may uh, start hurrying through the presentation so that um, we have plenty of time for questions um, at the end. Um, the next section, we will talk about various categories of plants and for various design situations. Um, as gardeners really can be a significant component of restoring the balance of our rapidly changing climate. It's really in desperate need of some resiliency. Restoring that balance can begin through communities working together and linking together in a green infrastructure. Every garden counts in all styles. When communities think collectively and gardens of all kinds knit together on behalf of larger ecosystems and watersheds, that each of our gardens becomes part of green infrastructure, groundwater restoration, nature oases, carbon sinks, heat sinks, and the wildlife corridors. There are a lot of clearly defined scientifically based solutions where gardeners can contribute to, the, to ecotones that become regenerative gardens. Um, everything we do adds to resiliency. Recently, I've been inspired by Obi Kaufman, an artist and environmentalist and author who, in my opinion, will one day even have the stature of John Muir he describes in his work what I think we all need to consider. My work operates in what can be called a post-environmentalist world where arguments of pure logic are over and we've moved on from merely toiling to prevent degradation to now greater visions wrapped up in better stories of how we mitigate catastrophe. Two opposing truths are relevant. The amount of biodiversity still extant is a miracle. And two, we are already in the bottleneck of cascading effects toward a permanently altered biosphere. In my own daily practice of making sprawling books of California nature, I aim to balance the discourse of this big picture stuff, all the while concentrating on the smallest geographically niche truths upon which the living world relies. I just love that. These niche truths, that's what gardens are. Each garden is its own niche truth. Um, so we'll start talking about various types of gardens. I hope each kind can apply to your own work and understanding. Um, I think all of us listening here today, gardener or not, need to advocate for gardens. Gardens matter. In the built landscapes of cities and suburbs, gardens make our lives habitable. They need to make the ecosystems habitable for all creatures, birds and bees to mushrooms and mycorrhiza. We've been through the ecosystems and those maps, and now I really want to get into more garden-oriented photos so that we can have a discussion. Most of the book really is a plant book. It's a reference and a tool. Nora, Nora Harlow, my co-author and the writer, has, has described some key design considerations, such as firescaping and carbon capture, soils, carbon sequestration, invasive plants, and water use. But there's really not a lot of design-specific or maintenance suggestions, but that's part of what I hope we could get into here today. Um, these four photos introduce us to what I will cover with a few really broad concepts that I hope um, were questions about specifics. In the upper left, we see a very small garden with a well-maintained small space California native plant garden, which might touch on a discussion of how to, you know, how to use, what sort of plant choices we use for each garden. In the upper right, we see a firescape, which leads to a discussion about design and wildlife urban interface. The lower right, we see a garden we chose for carbon sequestration. Uh, then in the lower left, we have a bioswale, which leads to a discussion about water and water capture, um, which to me is the most important consideration for a summer dry climate. The fact we get no summer water, that's not drought, that's normal. And so the, how we use and capture water is really, really critical. Um, this bioswale uh, will represent a broad category of water harvesting. Um, 
Imagine if municipalities required water capture and bios whales next to parking lots, such as this one at UC Davis. Um, as the water runs off the parking lot is clean and percolated before it gets into Apuda Creek. If we required these sort of uh, bios whales and gray water in all garden landscapes, having curb cuts to allow stormwater to circulate in the medians, to use appropriate climate tolerant plants and shrubs, and permitting cisterns and large scale rainwater capture, we should be requiring water to be percolated into the soil. This is what green infrastructure is really all about. And I, I honestly think it's part of the Green New Deal, how we can have jobs oriented toward the way we orient ourselves with the planet. Um, some other water ideas um, in the upper right, we see cisterns. Um, let's go right to them. Um, the, this is a, the garden of Judy um, Adler, an activist and teacher out in Walnut Creek. Uh, these are cisterns in her own backyard. She's uh, hidden them somewhat with the lattice fence and between her garden and the neighbor you see beyond. The cisterns are simply filled by gravity from roof water um, and then released as needed in the, um, not just the summer, I, I'm learning myself that the water we store in the winter should be used in the winter when the plants need it. I used to totally poo poo the idea of these small little 55 gallon rain barrels and why in the world would we wanna store 55 gallons of water in the winter um, thinking we'd keep it for the summer. Um, well, that's the wrong way to think about storing water. We store it for the winter. Um, increasingly with climate change, we have these massive storms and hopefully massive storms and then often long breaks between them. So if you store water in the winter, you should use it in the winter. If, it, if you store water and a few weeks later, it still hasn't rained, use that water. That's when the plants need it. The, all the plants that are adapted to summer dry climates expect winter wet. Um, so you cannot overwater them in the winter. And so I really, it's too late now. I mean, we're in the midst of a terrible drought again um, and it's not really winter anymore, but um, the idea of having cisterns is not simply to hold off and wait till the summer, it's to use it when the plants really need it. Um, another example of, of water harvesting and using water is this garden in uh, Woodland Hills, Southern California. I've included the, uh, the photograph, include the roof, because the, what happens here is the water, when it does rain, goes down through the gutter and then uh, percolates down through the front of the house in, in a sort of a rain garden. The designer has used some cleverly colored uh, gravel to, to imitate that, but, but fundamentally it's the water will allow to be percolated back into the soil and not run off into the drains, into the, into the storm drains. Um, we increasingly see a need to have water captured into the soil. Uh, any of us who remember Southern California in the last drought, how many street trees died um, because they never got any water, um, should understand the importance of this idea of, of percolating water back into the ground. Um, and I use this photo to illustrate uh, irrigation techniques. As I said, it's, the book is not about no summer water. It's about efficient water and the right choice of plants. Um, and any uh, garden needs, um, all plants need some water when they first start. So this is a very typical uh, drip irrigation system for a large uh, lawn replacement. Um, and the, over the year or two of this plants will be growing in the gardener might need to adjust the, the water, might add an emitter or two to extend the, the drip zones, but it, they still need some water, especially when they first start. Um, so this, again, this whole nother, there are books and books written about irrigation systems, but it's not a book about no summer water. Um, this is a, a particularly fun uh, installation that I, I, when I work in Southern California, there's a group called Urban Water Group. This garden in the front yard is a bioswale. It's a little bit hard to see it. It's grown in somewhat, but in the middle, there's a depression where water from the roof goes and percolates into the, into the ground. But what's really exciting here is the next door neighbor. The next door neighbor saw this one garden and said, oh, we like this idea. We want to do it too. So you see on the right, it's a fairly new garden at the time of the photograph, but there's depressions, there's irrigation, a fake stream sort of thing that the water does percolate from the roof. But when you see two gardens side by side, for me, the light bulb went off like, well, oh my God, what if every garden did this? These urban corridors, these wildlife corridors we talk about becomes much more relevant and, and much more doable. If each of us takes responsibility to percolate the water back into the ground, 
the, it changes the calculus of what cities look like. Um, and just seeing two gardens side by side is, is like a, you know, literally an epiphany. This, this is how it works. This is how it's going to happen. Um, and all, all of these gardens, I say, as, as Obi Kaufman said, these are nice truths. Each one ha has truth. Let's go uh, talk briefly about uh, firescaping, uh, which use this uh, photo to show low plants, a lot of succulents away from the house, having um, pavement between the house and the garden, showing uh, trees that are limbed up and not overhanging the house, all important considerations for firescaping. Um, for folks who like to have lawns, uh, Carex or sedge is a really good substitute for lawns, taking much less water, um, but providing some of the same look um, and some hydration and fire protection. Um, we chose this particular photo in the book. We talk about carbon sequestration, which is a really large and somewhat complex scientific uh, term that we, I won't try to go into much, but the basically we understand that plants sequester carbon. Um, and the more plants you have in the garden, the more carbon you can put back into the ground. And that's a, a healthy garden does that. Um, and so all the more reason to choose plants carefully that can the right sizes and, and those that really work and mingle well together. Um, and this, this photo really just to show, to bring water in the garden, even you don't necessarily have to have a pond or a waterfall, a simple fountain in an urn will encourage all sorts of bird life and insects. And it's, it's not just to speak of the garden itself, getting a sense of, uh, of wetness. Um, water is a great feature to add into gardens. Um, getting to talk about plants, that's really the, again, the fundamental part of the book um, this particular plant is a, it's a native California rhamnus. It's a coffee berry. It's, it's a, in a tiny little garden in Oakland. Um, and you can see it's been pruned to have a somewhat formal shape and pruned up from the ground that allows some light to get into the uh, lower part of the garden. For here we see uh, gilias and wildflowers that can sprout if the shrub is not allowed to be totally complete. Um, but it's, it's a native plant. It forms exactly this, performs exactly the same function as other kinds of shrubs, but a lot more ecosystem services. Um, when I included this photo um, is of Echium, and I gave my presentation at East Bay Mud for my first presentation with them, they looked at it with a fine tooth comb to make sure what I was doing was appropriate. And they got back to me and said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't allow you to show this in the, in the book because it's invasive. And I said, well, that's exactly why it's in the presentation um, as an opportunity to talk about invasive plants. This Echium um, Tower of Jewels is highly invasive in our area, along, especially along the coast, and really shouldn't be planted and probably not even sold. And so, but it's not the same for other parts of the whole summer dry climate. There are plants in one region that will escape and become invasive. Um, and we all need to recognize that and, and try to understand which plants are thugs. Um, in choosing plants, we choose them not just for uh, their function, we choose them for their beauty. Um, this is a, uh, I, I love this, this is a native uh, atroplex. Uh, it's, it's a garden in uh, Long Beach and it's a quail bush. It's a very common plant. Um, there's a nice stand of it in the botanic garden. They, um, they fit comfortably in the many native plants, but look how great it looks with the blue, fo blue flowers of the, of the Ceanothus. Um, again, knowing which plants to choose and how to use them is really at the core of the book. A lot of folks love succulents uh, with good reason. They're, they're really tolerant of dry conditions. Uh, they have an amazing number of forms and shapes and colors, um, but all the more reason to have a book to help guide you um, to which ones to use. So that if you go to a plant sale and you buy a four inch pot of some little cute uh, succulent or get a, um, one of those popular bowls of succulents that are wonderful presents, so oh, I'll put those in the garden and you realize how big they get. Um, so it's really you know, great in, in the, to, for the book to have these sort of references of which plants get big and which sizes they have. Um, this is a garden in Seattle, um, which gets, it does get no summer water but because it gets good water in the winter and the gardener understands how to use these various uh, herbs and rosemary, uh, lavender and such that, that with, require good drainage in Seattle, so it's planted on a slope, but with different colors and textures and um, creates a marvelous garden. Again, understanding which plants work well together. 
this is a really, uh, I could spend five minutes talking about native plants and which native plants are adapted to which parts of our own gardens. This is a Ceanothus called Valley Violet, uh, photographed at UC Davis, which is, you know, is a really hot interior conditions. Um, I think we all know that all California native plants are not adapted to all gardens. It's obvious, you know, a redwood tree is not adapted to inland areas, but it's equally, you should equally understand that a Joshua tree, which everyone thinks, oh, it's totally climate tolerant. Well, it's not going to be climate tolerant in Death Valley. You know, it, it's every plant is drought tolerant in its own climate. Um, this is a matter of understanding similar climates and why this uh, particular Ceanoth is adapted to inland areas. Uh, when you buy native plants, you'll find a lot of selections. Some were originally selected along the coast and they're not going to do well inland. Or plants that may have come from the mountains, they're not going to do well in the coast. Um, it's really important to use your various references. Um, the book is really just a starting point for something um, as sophisticated as native plants. And you really need to refer to local nurseries, uh, native plant gardens and such, but uh, the native plants are wonderful. I use them more and more in my own garden, but we really under understand which ones are really adapted, such as this one, uh, the flannel bush. Uh, it grows native uh, here in Marin County, um, and it gets to be a really big shrub. When I first fell in love with this plant, I lived in Sonoma, the town of Sonoma, nice and hot in the summer, and I killed two of these plants um, by watering them. In the, in the summer. That changes, the water changes the soil chemistry and they just don't like it. So you really need to understand it. And if you want one in your garden, maybe you have a small garden, you don't want a big one. Well, pick a small one, pick one like this. It's one called Ken, uh, Ken Taylor. Uh, it stays small and prostrate, cascading over, over, over um, rocks, um, but still giving the same look as the flowers as in the late spring and the ecosystem service of a native plant, but not so big. Um, and with succulents, uh, there are so many we can choose from. If you have space for a succulent, you may as well choose one that have special uh, beauty. Uh, here, this one, this um, uh, bright lights uh, agave is variegated. You can get a sense of, this, of the size and how it might really brighten up you know, a, a dark part of a garden. Um, manzanitas are one of our classic California natives that, um, that when they get large and older, they, they can no longer support as many leaves, um, so, but they die back. Well, that dying back reveals the limbs and the branch structure, which is fantastic and architectural in its own sense. So understanding how to use the native plants uh, here in this garden, I'm standing at the back door looking out at the pool um, and you can see underneath the plant and you can see all the way to the, to the garden beyond. Um, I, I love manzanitas. I have a bunch in my own garden and I'm, I'm glad some of them have gotten old and I can limb them up and, and see their architectural functions. I wanna to come to a point where I can talk about all the uh, wonderful botanic gardens that have influenced the work. Um, I'll try to go quickly now. Um, the Los Angeles History Museum has changed their, uh, their campus to allow a lot of beautiful gardens all around it. Um, uh, her own San Francisco Botanical Garden, which I, Lovingly, Matthew referred to as a subtropical cloud forest. It's not typically Mediterranean, but it's beautiful, incredibly beautiful. And part of that is because of the fog and the maritime influence. And that maritime influence is part of a lot of coastal California. Um, the Ruth Bancroft Garden over in Walnut Creek, as opposed to the Botanic Garden, is hot. Uh, it gets very little marine influence. What's so great about that garden is the plantings are old. Um, so that someone like me as a journalist can photograph plants that are mature, that have been sustained to give the audience an idea of what a garden should look like after years of working at it. Um, the UC Davis Arboretum is a fantastic resource. This is the store garden near their teaching Arboretum. I'm gonna go past it because I wanna get some questions. The um, Huntington Library in LA is a, has become a great resource. They've redesigned some of their entry gardens between the library itself and their conference halls with a series of small space gardens that have, use a lot of new plants in very ornamental fashion. Uh, this is they call the celebration garden, which is at the end of those demonstration gardens before you get to the larger part of the garden and uh, it changes. It won't, this is two years ago and I'm sure those Dazzlerian and purple euphorbias Will not be there anymore, but it's still a great resource to see how gardens work. Another of my absolute favorites is the regional parks 
botanic garden at Tilden, which is all native plants. And because it's such an older garden, the plants are mature. One gets a really sense of how mature plants work with one another. Um, it's a great resource for, for native plants. Um, this is a shot I took there just this past spring showing how uh, the native uh, uh, aspens um, look great when they're, when they're deciduous. So I really just want to come back to the whole idea that what we're gardening for is garden earth. This is back right here in Matthew in my backyard at Mount Cordell. Uh, it's the garden that we need to take inspiration from, you know, garden earth, uh, and fundamentally take our cues from that. Um, the, the, the project has the website. We have a newsletters for summerdrive.com. The Instagram account is fun because there are followers all over the world. Um, and hopefully it will engage you as well. But I think now I try to finish up, see if Matthew and the group have some questions. I'll go back to the patio slide. Yes, we'll do that. And um, see what questions we have. Great, thank you, Saxon, uh, for a great presentation. Um, as a reminder, you know, Saxon's new book, Gardening in Summer Dry Climates, Plants for a Lush Water Conscious Landscapes is out now. It can be found at the San Francisco Botanical Garden uh, Bookstore. And if you do have additional questions, now would be the time to get them in the Q&A. We do have a few uh, new ones that have popped up here. <clears throat> so I have, uh, this is a situational question. You know, I've kept, uh, I have a kept well on my property that I'd like to access to water the garden during droughts. What type of professional can open up the well and connect to irrigation? Saxon. Oh, that's, you know, that's, that's beyond my capacity. You know, there are, there are well, uh, services, the people that do wells. Um, I actually, in my next to my, where I live, the people in my neighborhood have wells and I keep thinking I'm going to tap into their well one day and for my irrigation because I can't responsibly add any lot more plants. Um, but it's, it's certainly possible and many, many gardens in the country have wells, but I, uh, I refer you to the internet to look for well, you know, people who do wells. Sure. Are, Great. Uh, with regard to carbon, can you talk about the use of biochar, Saxon? Uh, well, not authoritatively. I know there's a wonderful group um, in uh, Los Angeles, Petrocore Architects. They're doing a lot of work with biochar right now to talk about how it, um, uh, biochar is not charcoal. It's, it's, it's a way of, of taking, making charcoal and, and putting it back into the Soil, it's really good for soil. It restores a lot of soil uh, chemical balance for the mycorrhiza fungus, uh, but I have not used it and I've not done much research on it. So I, um, you may know something, Matthew, but I, I really don't. Yeah, uh, I have very limited knowledge on biochar, but this, this last, and maybe this is uh, maybe a last question or maybe second to last. Uh, this is, um, you know, I, my prior, um, career, I was in New York City, right? We had planting seasons, right? We would plant in spring and plant in fall. And uh, we would do that because in fall, the wind, the snow comes, the cold temperatures come, right? And in spring, the, the hot temperatures come. But in dry, summer dry places, is there a best time of year to plant? Oh, absolutely. Unquestionably, it's the fall. Um, it's because summer dry plants, as I said earlier, require winter wet to grow. And that's when they're growing. Um, the roots are growing underground in the winter. Um, and oftentimes they go totally dormant in the summer. They don't grow at all. Um, and if you apply water in the summer, you'll kill a lot of plants um, because you're changing the soil chemistry that the plants depend upon. And that's not always true by any means because there are many plants that, that do get watered in the summer. Um, and this, you see in my background slide here, these formiums. Uh, formiums get really big if you water them. Um, if you don't water them, they're really adapted to dry summers. Um, so a lot of plants I'm finding that are adapted to dry summers, they do fine in our, with water, but they grow too big. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they have short lives because they grow too big or too quickly. Um, that sometimes garden architects and designers, they want that. They, they want plants to grow in large. To, to, you know, the clients want things to happen quickly, but it's not necessarily a long-term success formula for sustainability. It's, it's really the right amount of water and letting plants grow slowly. But um, 
but after the fall is the time to plant. You, you, you can plant um, in the spring, early spring, when there's still moisture in the ground, um, na natural moisture in the ground. The plants won't grow quite as uh, much that first season, um, but I would almost never plant in the summer, except if you have a vegetable garden or you're planting some annuals for color, that's a little bit different, but your, your shrubs, trees, and perennials, uh, I would never even plant them in the summer, quite honestly. I'd keep it in the pot and then plant it in, in the fall. Great. And then thinking back about your work on the book, is there something that you personally learned? You know, what was your biggest lesson learned as you worked on this uh, book or, you know, you know, you know, in preparation of getting it published? Uh, well, I'm, I like to think I'm still learning. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant process. Um, I, I think because I've, I've recognized, as I said in the presentation over the years, that um, we garden differently here than on the, in the East Coast. And I, sure. you know, increasingly need to, you know, be responsible and socially responsible to show that how that looks like. So for years, I've been learning about it. I, I know one of the surprising things uh, and I went to Portland specifically to photograph for the book and talked to some of the great plant people up there. Portland's a fantastic gardening town and met with some people who were very eager to show me some gardens that were adapted to summer dry climates. And it was so funny, they'd show me these gardens with California native plants. And I kept saying, hmm. well, you know, I didn't come to Oregon to see California native plants, you know, but, right. but, with, the, but with climate change and, it, and the real adaptability of native plants, uh, they're great choices. Um, but it's just interesting to, to to learn what other people consider dry and, and the climate really has changed. It's hotter now in Portland than it used to be. Seattle, you know, one would not think of it as a Mediterranean climate, but it's certainly summer dry. It doesn't rain there for 12 or 13 weeks in the summer. It's not supposed to rain. Um, so the plants and the native vegetation need to be adapted to that. So it's, um, it's I said, the more I travel, the more I get excited by, by learning from what other people are doing. Um, it, it, it excites me to try to find more, and, it, and it's why the Summer Drive Project is not just a book. It's it's a whole concept of trying to show people what what's working. Because um, the planet, it, it it you know undeniably we're in crisis, and gardeners can be part of that solution, and we can take joy in being part of that solution. Great, and I think one last softball question for you: When can uh, oh, we head back over to do more weeding in uh, in your yard? <laughs> Um, well, let me look at the calendar. How about Saturday? Right? Yeah, right. Sounds <laughs> There's good. still lots of weeds. There's well, still lots of weeds. Yeah, that, that yeah. Would everyone who has a garden to get your weeding done, uh, don't let the plants go to seed. You know, it, it's still a little bit of moisture out there and, and get your weeding done now because um, the, the seeds, you don't want those seeds to be in the soil. That's right. So Saxon, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, you know sharing your incredible uh, you know, photographs and expertise with us this evening. And thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. And uh, we hope to see you at the San Francisco Botanic Garden um, soon and often thereafter. So thanks again, Saxon, and have a great night. Okay, thanks for inviting me. It's been great to be here. See you. See ya.